Okay, good evening everyone. Welcome to our evening Dhamma. And we're back to using uh, actual broadcast software. So we have some neat potential. You could see if you're watching on YouTube that we have a new intro again. The old intro is back. And we're all on camera now. So <laughs> everyone be very mindful. But just to say, don't do anything differently. Let me know if you don't want to be on camera. So today is, uh, before I get started, today is the, the beginning of the rains season in India. In Canada it's been raining all summer, so nothing changes there. But we keep to the tradition because, of course, it became much more than anything to do with just rain. The What we call the rains has become the three months uh, retreat or activity that, that where the monks stay put in one location and focus on self-cultivation and, and sharing the Dhamma as well because people know where to find them they stay put Not a lot's going to change around here, of course, except I may not go places as often as I otherwise would. But it's um, it's a, it's a, it's an important point to mark in the Buddhist calendar. Yesterday was the day I didn't mention it, probably. Um, it, it was the day where the Buddha taught the first discourse. So yesterday was the beginning, the, marks the anniversary of the beginning of Buddhism, where the Buddha taught the Dhamma Chakapavatana Sutta. And today would have been the day where he began to teach the five ascetics until they all became Sotapanna, at which point he taught the Anattalakana Sutta. So today is a good day to begin talking about mindfulness. Today we're talking about right mindfulness. And I was asked, this is something I was asked to talk about, not right mindfulness, but wrong mindfulness, which is basically to say to talk about the same things. Um, at a recent conference, many of you might have seen me give that talk. Of course, it's it's a interesting talk. It's perhaps the most interesting out of all of these because mindfulness is the most interesting to us. It's uh, we make this claim that mindfulness is like the key. It's where you begin on the prac on the path. You know, the Buddha often said as much. He said, you know, practice the four foundations of mindfulness. If you want a quick way to to uh, get to the core of the Buddha's teaching start by purifying your, your morality and, and cultivating right view and once you have those practice the four foundations of mindfulness I mean the core is really the four foundations of mindfulness but that quote does say something that hey wait you can't just start by practicing mindfulness when we talk about right mindfulness it, it, it requires some support is the thing is mindfulness can never be wrong. Mindfulness is a good thing. It's always good. The Buddha said, Satincha kuang bikave sabatikang wadami. I tell you monks, sati is always useful. He said that when one is never without mindfulness, this is the path of apamada. Apamada being uh, sort of the, the, the Buddha's last words, he said, Appamadina sampadi that means uh, heedfulness or diligence 
alertness, awareness, sobriety. That's what it is. Not being intoxicated by samsara. Being clear-minded. So the question of, of what it means to have wrong mindfulness is an interesting question. I mean, what we talk about right mindfulness, well, doesn't that just mean mindfulness? And in a way, yes, it does. But there are issues that we have to understand. And so at the talk recently, I, I, I mentioned four of them, four ways that mindfulness can potentially be considered wrong. But first we talk about what is right mindfulness and so the topic of tonight's talk is right mindfulness let's explain what we mean by mindfulness in the first place and luckily our predecessors have put together a compilation of all the many different types of dhammas and how they can be defined so they've, they've got really good concise definitions or ways of understanding all of these dhammas. In fact, they go beyond the definition. I mean, the interesting thing about the def a definition is it's still just words. Right? If I ask you to define mindfulness, it's not an easy thing to do. We shouldn't be too caught up. Uh, and and the, the texts are not satisfied with definitions. When we talk about what does this Dhamma mean, what does that Dhamma mean, they actually give us four aspects of each Dhamma. And the aspects are the characteristic or Lakkana, the uh, function or Rasa, uh, the manifestation, means how it, how it appears, and the proximate cause. These are the, the uh, the, uh, appear, the manifestation is the pachupartana, and the proximate cause is the padatana. Those are the Pali names. So, you, you given these three aspects, you can understand the Dhamma. What is it like? What is it? So the characteristic of mindfulness is to not waver. The characteristic of sati, remember, right? When we use the word mindfulness, we're just using a makeshift English translation. So we shouldn't get caught up when we say mindfulness, we automatically think of certain uh, a certain definition or certain qualities. It's not exactly what it means. This word sati. Sati is a is a aspect a quality of mind that doesn't waver. It's a quality of mind that is that grasps the object. Uh, it has a function of not forgetting. So our ordinary state of mind is forgetful. We we experience something, uh, but then we lose track of it. We get caught. We get lost in our reactions to it. Sati is also used in a in a mundane sense, so it means to remember things that happened a long time ago. This helps us understand what we mean by sati, because when we talk about it in a present context, we're not we don't mean anything to do with that kind of memory. But what it means is to remember now, and so we so often forget ourselves. The characteristic of mindfulness, whether it's based on the past or the future or the present or whatever uh, its function its purpose is to keep you f remembering and that's what sati means sati comes from the root sar which means to remember or to recollect it's the same as the word sarana you know when we talk about the refuge we translate sarana as refuge but it can also mean a recollection so when we take the buddha as our recollection we don't do anything without thinking about the Buddha. That means we take the Buddha as our sarana. Would the Buddha approve of this? Was this in line with the Dhamma? Is this something the Sangha would do? This is how we take refuge or sarana. Buddhang saranang So That's what sati actually means. It means to not forget, 
to remember these things. So when we talk about our practice, it means to remember the present moment, it means to remember what's actually happening now. This is why we remind ourselves, right? When you say to yourself, pain, pain, you're, you're cultivating this ability to not forget, hey, wait, it's just pain. No, no, it's not bad, it's not me, it's not a problem. Don't forget. If you forget, then you get caught up in what you think of it. You like it, you don't like it, and so on. The manifestation is guarding. So th this is the point, is when you remember the experience... You don't allow for the judgments to, to enter into the mind. It's, and l allowing judgments is considered forgetting. You've, you've lost reality. As soon as you say, this is good, this is bad, this is me, this is mine, anything, you no longer have anything to do with reality. You're, you're lost in, in imagination. It's not real. Liking something, right? this is good, this is bad, the liking is real. You know, the, the actual fact of liking is real. But something being likable or good or a problem and so on. This is all based on our own imagination. It's nothing to do with the actual experience. So our mind our, our mindfulness guards our mind from this. That's it's how it appears. When you're practicing then you're guarded, your mind is guarded. Or it appears as confronting the objective field, which um, I've talked about before. It means w not wavering, not running away from it, and not grasping onto it. Right? Our ability to confront our meditation and our, our, our progress is dependent on, upon our ability to confront our experiences objectively without reacting to them, without liking or disliking, and, and so on, right? And, and that, how do, we, how do we not react? We, we, not, we don't react by, by confronting, by learning to stand our ground with experiences. Bad experiences, don't let them upset you. Good experiences, also stand, stay with them, without judging, without clinging, without craving for them. This is what, how mindfulness manifests itself. It appears in this way, appears to be confronting the object. The proximate cause of mindfulness is something called tira sanya. And this, I would argue, is very much a description of, of using a mantra to, to, to focus the, your attention and to, to cultivate mindfulness. So the cause... Sanya is when you have a perception of something. You perceive, you know, you're seeing and there's a perception that I'm seeing something. There's hearing and a perception. Oh, now I'm hearing something. Uh, when you hear a cat, for example, or when you think of a cat, there's a perception, oh, that's a cat. This is sanya. Sanya is all these kinds of perceptions. Tira is, is, is when you... Is, tira means strong. So tira is, is when there is the perception and then there's the act... The activity, and this is important because mindfulness isn't something that just comes to you. It's something you work at, as our meditators are aware. Something that's hard work. But when you work at it, it, it fixes that perception. So seeing is just seeing. So when you say to yourself, seeing, seeing, you're, you're affirming that perception. And this isn't a modern thing. This is something that they did in ancient times. This is how they did meditation by reminding themselves. If you understand, if you read this and, and, and go through this, it's quite easy to understand why we meditate the way we do and how authentic is this sort of practice. And this is very much what the texts were describing. It's not anything that's radical or, or new in any way. Or its proximate causes the practice of the four foundations of mindfulness. And that's just a way of saying, you know, practically speaking, how do you cultivate mindfulness? Practice the four foundations of mindfulness. So, 
That's what it means to be mindful. That's right mindfulness or right sati. So the question of how it can be possibly wrong, I mean, this is the core of our practice. When you're practicing in this way, you should progress, right? So how it can go wrong is in four ways. First of all, you might you 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 don't practice. So m maybe you never come to practice meditation, or maybe you come to the meditation center and don't actually practice. You know, when that happens, well, you're not likely to succeed. You're not going to get far in the practice. So the first type of wrong mindfulness just means unmindfulness, and this is clear. As with all of the eight path factors, you know, if, if you don't have right mindfulness, it's wrong. You know, you're not on the path. You need all of these. You need to actually have the factor. So clearly that's wrong. Uh, the second one is is misdirected mindfulness. And I want to be clear, I've talked about this and get questions about it. I want to be clear, when I talk about wrong in this sense, we simply mean... Um, wrong in the sense of not leading to the goal that we're looking for. Misdirected mindfulness isn't wrong. I mean, it isn't unwholesome. It's just not going to lead you to Nibbana is the point. There are ways of being mindful that don't lead directly to Nibbana. You practice them exclusively and they themselves are not enough to lead you to enlightenment. So the first is mindfulness of the past. If you're mindful of, of things that happened a long time ago, that's considered mindfulness. You have this ability to remember things or recollect things. Your mind is fixed on things that happened in the past. And the same with the future. Maybe you're mindful of something that you have to do, something remembering the things that you have to do tomorrow or, or even making life plans, this kind of thing. None of that's going to lead you to enlightenment, and this should be clear. We're, we're all quite clear that for mindfulness to work, it has to be about what's happening now, because mindfulness is designed to help you understand reality. You know, it's designed to help you understand the nature of experience, and the only experiences we're having are here and now. Mindfulness of the past and the future have nothing to do with actual experience. They're, they're memories that we have, or conceptions. And the third is concepts, putting aside the past and the future. If we focus our mind on concepts, like beings, it's possible to be mindful of, of um, mindful of, of, of beings, like thinking of people, and like with with mind uh, with loving kindness meditation. Well, there's a mindfulness there. Or maybe you're mindful of uh, a, a color or a light or something, and you say blue, 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 or white, white, white. They're, these are types of meditation, and they involve mindfulness. They involve sati. Because your mind is not wavering, right? Your mind is clearly aware, but aware of a concept. Aware of the idea of white, or the idea of earth, or a candle flame. If you focus on that, there's mindfulness there. But because the idea of a candle flame, is because you stop using the actual reality and you end up just seeing it in your mind, a flame, and your mind is fixed and focused on the flame. I mean, that flame in your mind, the, the, the concept of fire, is, is not uh, impermanent, not unsatisfying, not uncontrollable. It's the kind of thing that is stable, satisfying, and controllable, or it seems to be. It doesn't change. You're able to adjust it, and you're able to expand it. What we're talking about here is samatha meditation. When you focus on a concept, you enter into this realm that is peaceful, fixed, calm, and quite amenable to your will. And, and it leads to all sorts of exceptional states of mind that are, are wholesome and positive but that won't lead you to enlightenment. Because they're not real. They're, they're arising in your mind. They can't show you impermanent suffering, non-self. They can't show you the Four Noble Truths. 
The third way mindfulness can be wrong is uh, when it's lapsed. And lapsed mindfulness really sounds a lot like unmindfulness because it is, in a sense, unmindfulness, but it's special in the sense that it comes about because one is practicing correctly. So because one practices mindfulness, positive states and negative states will, will come up from the mind. Um, take, for example, a negative state. Through practicing, one might experience um, past tra trauma coming up. That's a good thing. I mean, it's good that it comes up, but it can distract you. Because it's a powerful state, um, maybe past emotions that you've kept repressed, maybe you get really angry because of the practice, or afraid, or anxious, or depressed. Or all these bad habits that we keep inside come up, and they can be quite overwhelming. Uh, so it's easy to become unmindful when they arise. The same with good states. Many good states will arise. A meditator will feel peaceful, calm, happy. Uh, meditators, some meditators will see things, lights, colors, pictures. There's nothing wrong with any of these things. They're in fact considered to be good things, but very easily one becomes unmindful when they arise, getting caught up in them. Maybe one jnana is one one begins to understand things about oneself or even gain exceptional knowledges of past lives or reading people's minds or seeing things far away. Very easy to get distracted by that sort of thing. Some people have out-of-body experiences and then they're just totally gone. And no mindfulness after that because they get caught up in the state. So many different good states and bad states. And none of these states are a problem. You know, it's not bad that they come up. Seeing lights or colors or pictures isn't isn't a problem. The problem is they're they're enticing. They lead us to think, hey, maybe this is the path. They lead us to get distracted. And the same goes with negative states. Uh, we fix and focus on them rather than being mindful. The fourth way that mindfulness can be wrong is probably the way the Buddha meant when he talked about something called micca sati, which means wrong mindfulness. He probably meant it in terms of the Eightfold Noble Path, the other seven path factors. So if if you're mindful, and, and so this, this can be defined or described as um, impotent mindfulness. You're mindful, but it's ineffective. Why is it ineffective? Because you have wrong view. And until you give up that wrong view, it's going to prevent your mindfulness from uh, from doing its job, from bearing fruit. If you have wrong thoughts, if you have bad ambitions, wanting to hurt people or harm people, it's not easy to... your mindfulness just won't be effectual. You can try to be mindful and it's just going to be like banging your head against a wall because it's not accompanied by the factors that are required to progress. If you have wrong speech, wrong action, wrong livelihood, all of these will get in the way of being mi of your mindfulness bearing fruit. So you can sit down and try to be mindful, but you'll find it very difficult if you're engaged, if, if all any of these other factors are missing. wrong effort and wrong concentration if you have any of these mindfulness is not able to do its work which is why uh, with, say take my right effort and right concentration you, this is why you really need to sit down and do meditation do walking and sitting and engage in formal practice because you, just saying to yourself oh I'm just going to be mindful in daily life mm, very hard to cultivate the the associated states that are necessary so right mindfulness it's a little more involved than simply saying I'm going to be mindful in fact it's a little more than mindfulness the word mindfulness itself you know, that's not really the best translation and I hope 
by by providing you know those four aspects of sati you get a better sense of what we mean by mindfulness it's this it's a, it's an active state that requires work right mindfulness is really where we focus our attention as far as our work goes and try and cultivate actual um, recognition and remembrance and this fixed grasping of the object as it is not allowing the mind to fall into judgment or reaction that's what we mean by sati so there you go that's right mindfulness tomorrow right concentration and then we're done we'll move on to something else Thank you all for tuning in. Uh, we'll look and see if there are questions now. Does a fully enlightened being ever find meditation difficult? It depends what you mean by meditation. Um, if you mean doing walking and sitting, then of course, yes, that can be difficult for someone who's sick. But uh, an enlightened being will not find it difficult to be mindful. Um, I think it's, it's just, it just depends exactly what you mean by meditation. And it depends what you mean by difficult, I suppose. Can meditation heal the physical body? Are there s ways to specially aid healing certain body parts? Potentially. I mean, med the word meditation means many different things to different people. Uh, are there types of meditation? Oh, probably. I don't teach them. The problem with that is, of course, you get attached to to bodily health and... No, we're not about that because when you get attached to bodily health and you get more upset when you get sick, for example. How important is noting while meditating versus just trying to empty the mind? Well, trying to empty the mind is something quite different. We're not trying to empty the mind. Trying to empty the mind is like trying to empty the ocean of water. It doesn't really happen. The mind's function is to think. I don't know what it would mean to empty the mind. At certain times, the mind will be, I guess, quiet, and there you might say you've emptied the mind, but you haven't emptied it, it's just at that moment it's empty. But that, that moment is also formed, it's uh, impermanent, it's not going to last forever. So being noting is something quite different, we're not trying to empty it, we're just trying to be objective. How important is that? That's, I would say, essential. Unpleasant mental states are a result of the karma, karma done at the present moment and the results. Unpleasant mental states are a result of the karma done at the present moment. I don't know. It's a too complicated a question. I'm not really... I mean, it sounds like you're kind of on the right track, but...
I'm not sure what the point of the question is. I've had an emotionally crushing experience with a woman in the past. I turn to meditation because I don't want to suffer like that ever again. As I meditate, I try on purpose to remember certain moments with her. Just to try and understand the feeling of aversion, but it's really tough. Would you recommend me doing this? Do you think it's better if I ignore thoughts? You shouldn't do either. You shouldn't ignore or try to bring them up, you see. You see how this, we have this question and it, it, it gives us this dichotomy, which is not, not a, it's a false, di false, whatever, not dichotomy, but it's, yeah, false dichotomy, I guess. There's a third way. You know, the thoughts will come up, and if they don't, then no problem, right? We're trying to learn about ourselves naturally. Who are you now? Nothing to do with the past or so on. If you don't want to suffer like that ever again, well, that's interesting. Look at that. Look at the fear or the aversion or the anger or, or so on. Don't try on purpose to remember certain moments because that's not natural. That's cultivating a certain habit of focusing on past thoughts. I mean, it's not nat it's not observing your mind naturally. It's quite different. So it's not something you should try to do either. And ignoring is also wrong as well. If the thoughts come up, well, that's natural. Be mindful of them. The best way to be better prepared in the future is to be mindful now. To learn how to be mindful, because in the future, if that happens, you won't be as disturbed by it. The more mindful you can be. Do Buddhists say bless you after someone sneezes? Yeah, sure. Buddhists talk a lot about blessings. It's just not God bless you. Do arahants have liking or disliking? No, arahants do not have liking or disliking. How important is the Sangha to a practicing lay Buddhist? Told me that Jnana Tera. he committed suicide, I didn't know that. Not only because of his illness, but because he, too with, he was too withdrawn and the Sangha neglected or ignored. I didn't hear that story, no. Um, that's, that's two different questions. You're asking about Jnanavira and you're asking about the Sangha to a practicing lay Buddhist. He was obviously a monk and he had... I mean, he was quite controversial. I still don't quite get the controversy because I haven't studied his teachings, but I understood he was... He, was, he fell into the camp of believing that um, dependent origination only talked about this one life which goes against the commentary, so that's fairly controversial. Dependent origination is such a, an, a sort of an esoteric controversy, but in Buddhist circles they do debate this hotly. There were some famous monks who were very much against the commentary's interpretation, which is... Anyway, I've talked about that before. Um, but uh, how important the Sangha is? Well, it's important you understand what is meant by the Sangha. I'd refine that and say it's important to have a teacher. You, know, you can go without a teacher, but it's one thing that's really, really useful and beneficial. And you know, If you talk about what do you need to get through a forest, to go through the wilderness, well, there are certain things that you need. Um, uh, the best thing to bring them through the for through the wilderness is a guide, someone who can guide you through it. Uh, a map is useful, but it doesn't replace someone who's been through the forest many times and knows the ways and the dangers and so on, right? So uh, that's what, when we talk about the sangha. That's really the most important. And I'm not talking, you know, as a teacher, it sounds like th that might be some sort of, hey, you know come learn with me, you know, it's neat, it's important you be with me or something, but that's what the texts say. They're not so um, not so pro community. They're 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 all about, you know, find someone who can guide you, a good friend. 
and talk, when they talk about a teacher, they didn't really use the word teacher all that much. Uh, they used the word good friend, someone who gives you the meditation practice. Um, so, but as far as having a community, it's it's hit and miss, you know. I mean, there's there's good aspects. Of course, it's useful to live in a monastic or a meditative community. That's why people ordain as monks. Is it beneficial? Yeah, generally speaking. But it can be a hindrance. I mean, there are issues surrounding getting involved with other people as well. You know, if if the other people are having struggling in their meditation, they might just drag you down. The best sort of meditative community is where the people don't even interact. They have a teacher who leads them. You know, ideally, they would have the Buddha to lead them, and then they all just support each other by being a good example for each other. I mean, a Sangha is great when everyone's doing the same thing and, and practicing in harmony. Um, and it's not so much the interaction as it is the the um, examples that we set and the the harmony that 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 has a power to it you see everyone else meditating well you you want to meditate how do you find peace in a stressful situation well well there is no such thing as a stressful situation you learn that you learn that ex situations can't be stressful stress is a reaction to experience that's what mindfulness means. So if you haven't read my booklet on how to meditate, that might be a good place to start. Help you to overcome stress. I'm 17. Do you think I'm at an age where I could potentially dedicate my life to living the Buddhist way of life? Well, I don't know. It doesn't have to be all or, or nothing, right? At, uh, I know when I was 17, I would think like that. Yeah, I've got to jump into it, but you don't really. Try. Try practicing Buddhism. Read my booklet or, a bo or any book on meditation and begin to practice. But don't jump into it like thinking you have to become a monk or a nun. Uh, try it. And you'll find that it's much more gradual. That eventually you get more interested and, and over time, you devote yourself more. So, I mean, it's not being. I'm not trying to say. I'm not trying to dissuade you at, because you're 17. I'm just. Um, I, if you put left off that aspect of your question, I would answer the same way. You know, if you're if you're new to Buddhism, don't worry about dedicating your life to it. On the other hand, I suppose you might be asking. You might be saying, "Hey, I'm a Buddhist who's gotten really into it, but now I'm wondering." Am I too young to go the next step? Maybe that's what you're asking. Um, and the answer is certainly no. Yes, there are issues. Someone who's 17 may potentially, or many 17-year-olds are too immature to dedicate themselves properly, but certainly not the case with all. We have cases of 7-year-olds who... The Buddha put the limit at 7 years old. If you're younger than 7, no. Nah, not, not really not really likely you're going to be able to dedicate your life so 17 is fine it, it depends on the individual I mean there are 70 year olds who wouldn't be very good at dedicating their lives to Buddhism what do you think of suicide does it result in bad karma I think so I mean I, th I, I result in bad karma you have to rephrase that it is bad karma we would say the intention to kill yourself is probably pretty bad. Um, I, mean, I don't know. I'm not a Buddha to say, but again, it's not the action is not the problem. It's their state of mind. Why are you killing yourself? Probably there's some negative states involved with the desire to kill. Why would you kill yourself if you had no negative states in your mind? So it's those negative states that are karma. That's what we mean by karma in Buddhism. You have those negative mind states, them arising is bad karma. Right? And they will lead to, to do bad things and to cause suffering and so on. They will hurt you. They're bad habits to develop. What do you think of Jesus? Oh, I don't think of Jesus that often. I meditate about two hours a day. 
sorry, the, the, the point being that Jesus' question is it's nothing to do with our practice and we're trying to keep our questions focused on our practice. Otherwise, there's too many questions. I get a lot of these, what do you think of X questions and taken a, made a decision not to answer them. I meditate about two hours a day, uh, two plus hours a day. I got to be fair at staying with my breath. I'm unable to stay with my breath at all, even after a year. Yet the practice is often good stretching in periods. Should I pray through, or should I be looking to correct a practice? My aspiration, like yours, no doubt, is full operation. Um, well, it sounds like you're practicing a different technique. It's not really what we... I don't know if it sounds like you, you're not really practicing what I teach. Um, so if you're not practicing based on my booklet, there's not much I can do to... to uh, I can't really comment on it. I'd recommend if you haven't to read my booklet. I mean, maybe you have and maybe you are. But if so, then it would be, you know... Well, good if you've if you've got some states of uh, clarity of mind, that's good. But keep going. You know, check and see if you still have. Be mindful, and 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 you'll see if you still have defilements left. Do you suggest vipassana or anapanasati for improving concentration? Well, I don't teach improving concentration per se. I teach mindfulness. You know, there's obviously the best concentration comes from mindfulness, but mm, we focus more on mindfulness. So I can't really comment on that exactly, except to say that uh, what we focus on is sati. And by cultivating sati, then states like concentration or focus, they, they come as a result of the practice. Someone enlightened constantly noting. Does correct mindfulness mean constantly noting the present moment? No, the noting is the cause of mindfulness. It's a, it's a technique to cultivate mindfulness. An enlightened person is, is always mindful, so the corollary would be, no, they don't need to note. They're, they're just mindful. So the, the, the noting is our practice. It's this tira sanya where you strengthen your perception and that's what cultivates mindfulness. Where do I find the meditation booklet? Well, there's a link right above where you ask these questions. Right above the list of questions, we say, make sure you've read the booklet, How to Meditate. Now, hopefully that link still works. Yes, it does. So, there you go. And that's all the questions for tonight. Thank you all for tuning in.